The first lesson for this morning is found in John 20, verse 1 through 9, page 88 of the New Testament in the Pew Bibles. Listen for the word of God. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. The second lesson for this morning is found in Psalm 118, verse 14 through 24, page 439 of the Old Testament in the Pew Bibles. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
The third lesson for this morning is found in John 20, verse 10 through 18, page 88 of the New Testament in the Pew Bibles. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabawi, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, <clears throat> giving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, open our hearts and our minds by your Spirit. For it's only by your Spirit that we may see and hear and understand, Lord. So I need you to strengthen my words because mine are empty and you hold the very words of life. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, assumptions can make for a, a funny situation or a, a downright awkward situation, of course. Uh, one of the funny things that I get to experience as I go through um, uh, my work here as a pastor, of course, is uh, the natural part of being a pastor is you do funerals. Well, when I do funerals, I generally don't put on robes until the very last minute, and I'm usually in the narthex. And if you're a member of Good Shepherd, you know who I am, but it's funny to see the number of people who will walk through and not say anything to me. It's kind of an assumption made because, frankly, in a suit and shaven and, and uh, with my age or lack thereof, I just don't look like your typical Presbyterian pastor. I mean, we have an example of a typical Presbyterian pastor. Um, <clears throat> And you can see, we're, we're just a little bit different. They make that assumption, and what's funny is when I put my robes on and come down the aisle, and you can hear a few people saying, that was the minister. <laughs> and it's funny how many people then after the service talk to me. 
Assumptions can be a funny thing. Like I said, they can, they can be downright awkward as well. Uh, Katie and I, being the ages that we are, have had the awkward situation of someone wondering uh, if she's pregnant, and you go, hmm, no, oh, no. Do you feel tense now? Have, have... <laughs> they can be, assumptions can make things awkward as well as funny. But some assumptions can also lead, of course, to some disturbing results. Uh, We have a dog, Chauncey, that we've had for several months now, and we have a fenced-in backyard. We've got a shadow box fence, and there's a a gate that leads back to the garage. And we let Chauncey out into the backyard, of course, and uh, we assume, if our memory doesn't say otherwise, that the gate is closed, because we typically try to keep it closed as much as possible. Well, when you make that assumption and you don't verify, the results can be disturbing when you discover Chauncey isn't in the backyard. Where is he? And so the assumption leads to something rather disturbing. Mary Magdalene and the other women who went with her who aren't mentioned in this particular passage made an assumption about Jesus and the results of that assumption were disturbing. They were utterly terrified actually at, at the thought of what they saw. Jesus wasn't where they expected him to be. Mary comes to the tomb very early in the morning, likely to bring spices and and to prepare the body further because Jesus was taken off the cross rather hastily and you need a good proper burial under Jewish law. There wasn't enough time for that and so she's coming on the first possible day after the Passover in order to make sure that that work gets done. Her assumption, of course, is that Jesus is going to be there. Jesus is going to be in the tomb. Her assumption is that she is going and it will complete her tasks. But of course, Jesus isn't there. The discrepancy between her assumption and the reality of seeing the tomb opened up leads to some very disturbing thoughts. Ones that cause her to run and to go seek out the other disciples because this is this is upsetting news. And of course, if you're sitting there, like, uh, sitting there thinking, yeah, of course, yes. Think if you go to, the relative, uh, go to the grave of a relative and find that they are no longer there, you're going to be a little disturbed. This is a very upsetting moment. She runs to the other disciples because he isn't there. You know, typically, when I can't find it, it's because it's right where it's supposed to be. Uh, This morning, I was, uh, last night, I was getting ready, setting out my clothes for the day today, and I couldn't find my tie. And of course, the one place I didn't look was my tie rack, because why on earth would my tie be on my tie rack? And I'm searching around, and I'm getting upset, and finally, Katie says to me, have you checked the tie rack? Why would I do that? And lo and behold, after writing my sermon, it was there on the tie rack right where I should have expected it. Jesus, they couldn't find Jesus because he wasn't right where they expected him to be. As a result, Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, we can surmise that that's John, uh, just because of writing conventions here, go and they run towards the tomb. And of course, we get this funny little anecdote that the one, the other disciple outruns Peter. Of course, just a funny little side note that says that, well, John was probably young and in shape and Peter was not as young and just follow it through. And John gets there first and he takes a look into the tomb, but he doesn't go in. He waits for Peter, and they look in, which apparently Mary Magdalene didn't do because she would have known that someone didn't just take Jesus. 
when Peter and John look in, the, the linen strips that they had wrapped Jesus' body in were still there. In fact, when, the, when they go in and look further, the cloth that went around his head was there separate from the linens. This indicates that Jesus wasn't just taken because usually if a grave in those days were, was opened and this was a common problem, if grave robbers came by, the linens are the expensive things. Those are things that will fetch money around. Not the body, of course. So the only thing without value is the thing that's gone. And they look, and Peter continues to be confused and disturbed. But it's at this moment that, that we find out that John believed. Because Jesus wasn't where he expected him to be. He believed somehow that Jesus was alive. Somehow, he wasn't dead. What's common to everyone here, to, to Peter, to John, and to Mary, is that what they do know is that Jesus isn't where they expect him to be. The tomb is empty. And what that results in for two people is confusion and fear. A further questioning of their faith because the, the crucifixion was tough enough on their belief. This isn't how this was supposed to go. But for one, it confirms their faith. It confirms their belief in Jesus. Well, let me suggest that when we don't when Jesus isn't where we expect him to be, that we are more likely than not worried. When Jesus isn't where we expect him to be, that usually causes us to question our faith, not be reassured of it. Like Peter and Mary, we, we tend to fear that our faith is coming to nothing. When a prayer isn't answered, when, when things go wrong, when things go badly, we, we question rather than trust. When Jesus isn't in our liturgy or in some of the ways we do ministry or worship, we get nervous. And it might make you a little bit nervous to hear that most of the time I don't particularly find Jesus in the sanctuary. The minister just said Jesus isn't in the church. It's true. Most of the time I don't find Jesus in the sanctuary. Monday through Saturday, when I come in here, I actually find this room to be particularly empty. Outside of worship, this, the room is frankly bare. Perhaps that's a bit disturbing because that's a, precisely where we expect to find Jesus. Jesus. We expect that when we leave on Sunday that Jesus is right here waiting for us for the next Sunday when we come in. We want Jesus to, to be sitting here waiting. But the reality is, He's not here. And we can get disturbed by that. We can get nervous by that. We question because of that. Mary, Peter, and John were expecting a dead immobile Jesus. And if we're surprised to find the sanctuary particularly empty Monday through Saturday, then perhaps what we expect is a dead, immobile Jesus as well. Of course, this isn't the first time that the disciples had heard of something like this. They had been with Jesus for three years. Jesus had predicted on a number of occasions that he would die. Mark records three different occasions and mentions that there are others, that he began to, at one point, speak openly about the fact that he would have to go to Jerusalem and die. And Jesus even rebuked Peter at one point because Jesus said, I'm going to have to go and die. And Peter takes him aside very knowingly and says, Lord, this isn't how this Messiah thing works. Let me tell you how this is going to go down. And Jesus said, uh-uh. 
Get behind me, Satan, because you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. They hadn't, they had heard that Jesus was going to die. They had heard that he was going to rise again. But the disciples, despite years of being with Jesus, despite years of seeing the work and ministry he did, despite the years of teaching and despite the years of miracles, despite seeing Lazarus brought back from the dead, the 5,000 and the 4,000 fed, despite lepers being healed, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and the deaf hearing, they just didn't understand what was going on. They didn't understand the scriptures. Still, at that moment, when they found the empty tomb. You know, I was, as, a, uh, as an elementary and a high school student, I've, I've said this before, I was bad at math. I had a math tutor at one point. I, had to, I needed some help with math. And I'm sure that the people who tutored me in math were fine people who understood math far better than I, than I did and, and, and tried their best, but bless their hearts, they just they couldn't get through to this poor soul. No matter who it was or no matter how well they explained the mathematical concepts, I just didn't understand. Even with the best, best tutor, we can miss understanding things. And here, the disciples have Jesus. They have God incarnate walking with them for three years. And they still miss the point. They still don't understand. And what we see here is that we need each other. We are given the church as a gift to spur us on, to tutor us, to help us learn, to correct us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to help make lighter that which is dark in our understanding of the Bible. I, I think too often we take for granted that if, well, if I have my Bible and I know the answers from Sunday school, Jesus, of course, answer, that we can get through. So why if the disciples after three years of walking with Jesus personally and not understanding, do we think that we can skate through on Sunday School Answers? Why do we allow ourselves a cheap form of the gospel and a cheap understanding of God when even the best tutor couldn't get the chosen 12 to understand? The question to ponder on Easter morning. We continue with our story, of course, and the disciples go home. John uh, being encouraged, Peter still confused. They go to their homes, and Mary stays by the tomb. She is weeping outside of the tomb because Jesus isn't there, and she was expecting to find him, and she has lost him for the second time in three days. And she's standing there and that's when the angels appear. And they say, woman, why, why are you crying? It's the, the way of the angels stating, why aren't you rejoicing? And indeed, that she says what we expect that she would say that I've lost the Lord, they've taken him away, and I don't know where they've placed him. And she turns, and, and Jesus is there, and he asks her the same thing. And she doesn't recognize him until finally he says her name, Mary. And at once, she recognizes him. And once Mary recognizes Jesus... She falls and hangs on to him. I don't know about you, but when I go looking for my keys and get frustrated, if I pull, pull them out of the key bowl next to the, next to the door, I just grab them lightly. When I have been searching for 20 minutes and I find them, 
I clutch those things. Jesus, Mary has lost Jesus and found him. And she is excited and as much as I might clutch my keys when they've been lost, she clutches on to Jesus. I found you and I'm not letting you go. But what we find here is that Jesus has some place that he needs to be. Mary no sooner has recognized Jesus and probably fallen to his feet and clutched those feet that Jesus says, don't, don't grasp me, don't hold on to me. Because I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. She's happy to have found him and Jesus right away says, I've got places to go and I've got people to see. Let me go so I can take care of things. And I think that we behave much in the same way as lost keys and Mary finding Jesus when we find those moments when we feel close to God, when we find moments that we feel we have found God, we like to clutch onto those moments and not let them go. We want things held together. We want them to be just the same way that we remember them. We want that feeling, we want that experience, we want that closeness, and we don't want to let it go. However, what we learn from this passage is that Jesus usually has some place he needs to be. And he has something that he's trying to do. And the reality is if we hold on too long, we're going to miss what it is that he's trying to accomplish. What he's trying to do. So what is it that we need to do? Mary gives us the good example here. She lets go. And she follows through with what it is that Jesus asks of her. Jesus says, don't hold on to me. In the very next verse, we find out that Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told him all the things that Jesus had said to her. She goes right away. We don't find out that she says, now wait a minute, Lord, I have a few questions. How did this happen? What's going on? We find out that Mary Magdalene went. She lets go and follows through. I remember as I was a kid at Highland Presbyterian Church in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, as I was in high school that the phrase was going around, let go and let God kind of feels freeing to just, oh, I'm going to let go and let God. But what we see here is that we don't let go and let God. We let go and we follow through on what it is that God has for us to do. Because the resurrection, resurrected Jesus doesn't just have things that he needs to do himself. He has things that he needs us to do as well. And so Mary Magdalene goes and she bears witness to a living and mobile Jesus. Not a dead and immobile one. She delivers the message of what's next for the disciples. Now whether they understand it is a totally different sermon. But she does what she is supposed to. She follows through and delivers the message. I have seen the Lord. And so our job isn't just simply to sit. It isn't simply to come into the church on Sunday morning and worship and go home. Jesus has things he wants us to do. Jesus has things that he's doing. Sometimes, of course, we do listen and learn at the feet of Jesus. But when Jesus moves, we move too. We don't sit where we thought we left him and, and wait until the next time that we want to see him again and come back. He has things he wants us to do. 
And so this Easter morning, this resurrection morning, we find three things. That Jesus isn't always where we expect him. He's living and mobile after all, and just like you don't expect to see me in my house all day, every day, Jesus isn't here all day, every day. Frankly, he's out somewhere else most of the time. The second thing that we find is even with the best tutor, we can still fail to understand the Scriptures. We need one another to strengthen, to encourage, to push one another, to help one another. And the third thing we find is that Jesus has some place He needs to be. And He has something for us to do. Are we going to let go and follow through? Let's pray. Lord, you are living and active. You have things that you are trying to do, redemption that you are bringing into our world. Help us to participate in the mission that you have and that you have called us to. Seal this word in our hearts so that we may live by faith in you, the living, active, and reigning Lord. Amen. Let's stand and sing our hymn, O Praise the Name. Let's be seated. Come to our time of prayer, and I'll start with requests and praises over here. Mary.
we were talking to. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> She's not traveling right now, though. <laughs> absolutely. Amy Jo. Yes, absolutely. Carolyn. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Vicki. Absolutely. Oh, Alana. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Yes, yes. Over here. Joe. Yes, absolutely. Bob? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, Chris? Yes. Balcony, Stu? Yes. Casey? Yes, absolutely. Sharon. Finish up, yes, absolutely. Sarah. Yes. <laughs> Brett. Yes, absolutely. Dave. Yes. Choir. Edie. Jeff, Jerry, and Mom and Pop's wife. Yes. Jerry? The Deneckers, the Patches, and Kim and Tom. Yes. Sue? My friend Bonnie, we've been praying for. Yes. She's been declared cancer free. Wow. Fantastic. So, Praise God. So, Becky, um, and my daughter's coming from Arizona, so on the 19th, pray for a safe flight. Absolutely. Absolutely. Vicky. Wow. Yes, absolutely. Oop. Michelle and Betty and Linda. Yes. Paula? My brother Brian and the Wells family is my Yeah. Yes, absolutely. John? Yes. All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Oh Lord, we praise your name, for you are the Redeemer God, you are the Living One, you are the One who was and is and is to come. We praise you that you are not just in one spot, but you are on the move, you are seeking to redeem the world that you have created. And Lord, when we consider all that goes on in our world, it is comforting to know that you are indeed looking after it and you want to bring us into a closer relationship with you. Lord, we do ask for peace in our world. As the trouble of the world and the war zones of the world come to mind, we ask that you would work your redemption in it. That as we sow violence, you would sow peace. We ask that you would work through us as your instruments of peace. Show us how we can bring your redemption into our daily work and to our daily lives. Lord, we give you thanks for this church community, for this community of faith that we call Good Shepherd. We give you thanks for the faithful elders who give of their time who, to lead the church, to guide and to, to direct. And Lord, as they meet this week as the session, we pray that you would give them wisdom and understanding. That you would guide us in the ways of your work. That we would seek your discernment. That we would seek your Holy Spirit 
to direct what we are to do and to, to be in this community. We give you thanks, Lord, for all the ways that our community is a blessing. We give you thanks for the Rock Island and the greater Quad City area. For Lord, there is much to be proud of even as we recognize that there is much brokenness. We pray for those, Lord, among us who are looking for hope, for those who are seeking something to hold on to, that would want to grasp onto your feet as Mary grasped onto them. Lord, help us to show your love, to show your grace, to bear witness to the fact that you are living and active among us. We raise as well, Lord, prayers for those who are on our hearts and our minds. We have named many. And we ask particularly for prayers for Penny, that you would strengthen her and look after her. That as you have appointed Mary, you would appoint all who are around her to bear witness to your spirit and to your work. Lord, we lift up to you Robin, Jack, Ron, Jim, and Bill, that you would minister to them and supply for their every need, Lord. There are so many other things that are on our hearts and our minds, Lord, that have gone unspoken. We lift those to you now. As well, Lord, we lift up to you those that we want to see come into a relationship with you to know your hope and to know your grace. We praise you, O God, that you are living, that you hear us, and that you respond according to your good will. Help us to trust in you even if we see things that cause us to doubt and to have fear. Hear us, Lord, as we pray as your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We can be faithful stewards of our time, our talents, and our money so that our treasure is in heaven and our giving pleases God. Will the ushers please receive the morning offering?
from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord, we return to you these gifts and offerings. May they go to further your ministry here in the Quad City area and into the world as you have called us to go. Through Jesus Christ, our risen and living Lord, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> go ahead and kick it up. Christ the Lord is risen today, Alleluia. All creation join to say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high, Alleluia. Sing, O heavens, and earth reply, Alleluia. Love's redeeming work is done, Alleluia. Fought the fight, the battle won, Alleluia. Death in vain forbids him rise, Alleluia. Christ has opened paradise, Alleluia. Lives again our glorious King, Alleluia. Where, O oh, death, is now your sting, Alleluia. Jesus died our souls to save, Alleluia. Where your victory, O oh, grave, Alleluia. As we go forward, remember that Jesus isn't always where we expect he'll be. He's not sitting waiting, but he has given us one another to encourage, to strengthen, to teach, to tutor. And Jesus has some place he needs to be, some work to accomplish and he invites us to be a part of it. Will we let go? And will we follow through? Receive the benediction. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you are, God has placed you there. Wherever you go, God is sending you. He has something he wants to accomplish through you where you are. And Christ who indwells you has something he wants to do through you. Believe this and go in the grace, the power, and the love of the risen Jesus Christ this day and every day. Amen.